This talk is about spinal cord and spinal nerve lesions. These are the class objectives. You do not need to read them. We will use them to chart our talk. The talk will be conducted using conversational and question and answer formats. The first question is, the layer indicated is the arachnoid, A true, B false. In this specimen, you can see the vertebral artery, the posterior ligament, a spinal root ganglion, dura matter, which I have now traced in magenta to make it easy to indicate the epidural space. In it, we find epidural fat and vessels. Under the dura, we find the subdural space, which in life is a virtual space. Now I am pointing to the arachnoid, which I have traced in aqua. Inside we find the subarachnoid space, which is the space occupied by cerebrospinal fluid with its arachnoid trabeculations. We can also see the denticulate ligament. The denticulate ligament are bilateral thickening of collagen component of the pia matter that attach to the dura, thus suspending the spinal cord. This is another specimen of a spinal cord, the lower vertebra being T10. You can see the pia with a little bit of imagination, the arachnoid, the suparagnor space, the dura, the subdural space, that in life, as we mentioned, is a visual space. Outside the dura, we have the epidural space, which is a real space. And in the dorsal aspect of the canal, the ligamentum flabum. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The spinal cord has eight cervical segments. A true, B false. The spine is a tubular structure with no apparent physical segmentation, but it has two enlargements. One corresponds to the C4 to T1 spinal segment called cervical enlargement, and another one below called lumbar enlargement. It goes from L2 to S3. This enlargement corresponds to the spinal cord regions that innervate the limbs. The spinal cord is divided, as you know, in five major regions. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. It extends from the foramen magnum to the lower level of L1 vertebra or the upper level of L2 vertebra in adults. The spinal cord is in a canal formed by the vertebral bodies in their arches. There are eight cervical segments corresponding to eight spinal nerves. The first spinal nerve exits the spine, the spinal canal between the skull and the first cervical vertebra. The first spinal nerve is peculiar because unlike all other spinal nerves that are constituted by the union of a ventral and a dorsal root, C1 spinal nerve most of the time is constituted by the ventral root only. Thus, it has no sensory component. As a consequence of C1 exiting the spinal canal above the C1 vertebra, the cervical spinal nerve from the second to the seventh cervical exit the spinal canal above the num numerically corresponding vertebra. And C8 spinal nerve 
exits below the C7 vertebra. From then on, all spinal nerves, all thoracic spinal nerves, that is from T1 to T12, all lumbar spinal nerves, that is from L1 to L5, all circular spinal nerve, that is from S1 to S5, and even the coccygeal nerve exit the spinal cord below the corresponding num number vertebra. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Neurological exam reveals a T12 sensory level in a patient involved in a car accident. Which vertebra is more likely to be fractured? A, T6, B, T9, C, T12, D, C8. This figure is a sensory dermatomal map. I like to represent the map in this position, bent forward, to remember that the butt is innervated after the toes. Yet, for the purpose of everyday clinical practice, it is better to use the upright model to indicate the relation between sensory level and site of a spinal injury. A sensory level at C3 implies that only C2 and cranial nerve sensation, mainly to geminal, are present. Remember, there is no C1 dermatome. Also remember that for this example, the deficit is bilateral, so no pain, thermal, or discriminative sensation is present at C3 and below on both sides. In the presence of these findings, spinal pathology is likely to have occurred at the level of the third cervical vertebra. As I have indicated with the white dot in this frame, notice that the term sensory level is usually used by most neurologists to indicate the first dermatome devoid of sensation. In the presence of a sensory level at C6, no pain, thermal, or epicritic sensation will be present at the C6 or lower dermatomes. The site of a spinal cord injury is likely to correspond to the level of the fifth cervical vertebra, as indicated by the white spot in this frame. A sensory level at the level of the nipples, that is in the T4 dermatome, is likely to correspond with the spinal cord injury at the vertebral level of T2, that is, as it is the case with the lower cervical sensory level, upper thoracic sensory levels are associated with the spinal cord damage at about two vertebras above the sensory level. A thoracic 12th sensory level due to spinal cord injury will affect all sensory modalities which I have enumerated in this frame. Below T11. With such findings, the site of a spinal cord injury is likely to be at the level of T9. Here I have represented this level with a white spot again, that is, the spinal injury will be three vertebrae bodies above the dermatomal sensory level. Hence, where there to be a fracture vertebra, the fracture would likely involve T9 vertebra and not T12 vertebra. It is also important to realize that the spinous processes tips are not in line with the vertebral bodies, especially in the cervical and thoracic regions. So, in this case, where we to describe the site of core injury based on the level of the spinous process, we would say that the spinal sensory level corresponds to a spinal cord injury at the level of the tip of the T8 spinous process. And a C1 sensory level, as indicated in this frame, is likely to be associated with a T12 vertebral pathology. It is good to remember, as a rule of thumb, that lower thoracic sensory levels 
are associated to vertebral fractures three vertebral bodies above the dermatoma level, and that all lumbar spinal cord injuries are usually encountered with T10 and T11 vertebral fractures, whereas sac sacral spinal cord injuries are seen with T12 or L1 vertebral fractures. I will address this issue again in the next question. So the answer to this question is B, T9. Next question. Neurological exams reveal a T5 sensory level in a patient involved in a car accident. Which vertebra is more likely to be fractured? A, T3, B, T9, C, T12, T, C8. This frame shows an spinal cord and a spinal canal. The fact that the spinal cord is shorter than the spinal canal and that the spinal segments are defined according to the spinal nerve to which they contribute leads to a discrepancy between the spinal segments and the adjacent vertebras. This is important because when we examine a patient following a car accident and we find a sensory level at, let's say, T12, we need to have an idea which vertebra is likely to be compressing the spinal cord in order to guide the radiological evaluation. In the next few frames, we are going to correlate spinal segment level with adjacent vertebra. The upper cervical spinal segments are situated at the corresponding vertebral level. Hence, a patient with a C3 spinal level indicating C3 spinal involvement is likely to have a C3 vertebral fracture. The lower cervical spinal segments are not situated at the corresponding vertebra. The fracture vertebra is one vertebra above the vertebra that numerically corresponds to the spinal cord level. Hence, a patient with a C6 level is likely to have a fracture in the C5 vertebra. The upper thoracic spinal segments are not situated at the corresponding vertebral levels as the lower cervical spine segments are, but the gap is even bigger. The fracture vertebra is numerically two vertebras above the numerical equal spinal cord level. Hence, a patient with a T5 spinal cord injury is likely to have a T3 vertebral fracture. An injury involving one of the lower thoracic spinal segment is seen with fractures three vertebra above the numerically equal spinal level. So a T10 spinal segment damage is associated with a T7 vertebral fracture. An injury involving one of the lumbar spinal segment is seen with fractures three to five vertebra bodies above the numerical equal vertebra. So an L1 to L5 deficit, let's say a deficit at L2 level, likely to occur in patients with fractures involving T10 vertebra. Patients with neurological deficit corresponding to the sacral and cruciate lesions are likely to have a fracture in a vertebra 5 to 10 vertebras above the numerically corresponding vertebra to the spinal cord level of injury. So a deficit at a spinal level S2 is likely to occur with a fracture at vertebral body T12. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. C8 spinal nerve passes through the foramen between the arches of C7 and T1. A true, B false. In this figure, you can see three vertebras. There is no C8 vertebra body. 
the seventh and eighth cervical spinal nerve are indicated in this frame as they emerge through the intervertebral foramen. C8 spinal nerve exit the spinal canal between the arches of C7 and T1. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The gray spinal cord matter has a butterfly appearance. A true, B false. This specimen corresponds to a transfer cut of a cervical spine segment. The gray matter, as you can see with a little imagination, resembles a butterfly. In this specimen, we can label the following landmarks. The anterior median sulcus. Behind it, we find the ventral white commissure, here looking blue because of this, this specimen was prepared with a blue myelin stain. Thus, the myelin looks darker than the great matter. You can also see the anterolateral sulcus, the site of exit of the ventral roots. The posterior median septum, which if you read Barr's book does not exist, is indicated in this frame. The posterior intermediate septum, which separates the inner fascicle called gracilis from a lateral place fascicle called cuneatus. And the dorsolateral sulcus, the site of entry of the dorsal root, rootlets. Notice that the term anterior is used interchangeably with ventral and posterior with dorsal. I will also use this spinal specimen to label the great matter major component present at this level, which are the ventral horn, the intermediate zone, and the dorsal horn. The white matter in this region is divided in three funiculus, dorsal, lateral, and ventral funiculi. The boundary between the dorsal and the lateral funiculi is the dorsal root entry. The boundary between the ventral and the lateral funiculus is an arbitrary line going from the tip of the ventral horn to the anterior lateral sulcus, as I have indicated in this frame. The anterior lateral sulcus is the site of exit of the ventral rootlets. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Lumbar puncture should be done at L4 to L5 or L3 to L4 interspace. A true, B false. This is a picture of a patient laying down. As you can see, the iliac bones and the vertebra have been traced and the lumbar vertebras have been numbered. Now I have drawn a line going by the top of each iliac crest. You can see that the line goes through L4. This line helps us decide where to put the needle for a lumbar puncture. The preferred place for a lumbar puncture is between L4 and L5 spinous processes. Or uh, the second choice is just above the line that I have just drawn, that is between L4 and L3 spinous processes. These locations are chosen in order to avoid a spinal cord damage. In this frame, you can see a segment of a spinal cord that includes a conus medullaris trace with uh, a black line and the cauda equina. Now I have represented a vertebra. This vertebra corresponds to L1. You can see in the figure that the conus is still present at this level. The arrow is pointing to the actual cord in this 
frame. At the level of mid L2, that is at the level of the middle of the second lumbar vertebra, the conus is no longer found. And it is certainly absent at the level of L3. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The dura attaches to each vertebra. A true, B false. This is a diagram of the lower spine. As you can see, the tip of the conus is at the level of the lower half of L1. I will now indicate various components present in this diagram. The supraspinatus ligament, the interspinatus ligament, the ligamentum flabum, epidural space, the dura matter, the subdural space that as we have mentioned previously is a virtual space, the arachnoid matter, with its trabeculation inside is the superagnular space bathed in in cerospinal fluid represented in green and the filium terminalis that is a continuation of the pia matter that at the end is enveloped in dura and fuses with the bone periosteum at about the second sacral vertebra. This is the second site of dural attachment, the first site being the foramen magnum. At all other places, the dura is unattached to the vertebras. This is a specimen of the lower spine. You can see the dura, the filium terminalis consisting at this level of pia, but when it comes close to the bone, the filium terminalis consists of pia and dura. This structure is attached to the periosteum of the sacral bone as we just previously mentioned. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. All spinal segments look the same. A true be false? The answer is a definite no. All spinal segments do not look the same. This is an infrequent dissection where the brain and the spinal cord have been dis dissected in one piece. Here I am indicating various spinal cord levels. And now the corresponding specimen inside an schematized spinal cord. This bulge, the one that I have just labeled, corresponds to the cervical enlargement, and this one to the lumbosacral enlargement. I will use this figure to point out the characteristics present at different spinal cord levels. Here, the arrow indicates to C3 spinal segment, which I have enlarged in this view. Notice the following. There is more white than gray. The gracilis and the cuneatus are present. You can tell by the presence of a posterior intermediate septum separating them, which is hard to see in this specimen, and because of the small indentation in the contour of the dorsal surface of the spine, as pointed out by the yellow line. The slender gracilus brings lower body conscious epicritic sensation and the triangular cuneatus bring the same type of information from the upper body. There are no lateral horns, as you can see in the area in circle. The anterior horns are not rounded. The dorsal great matter separation or span is wider than the ventral 
3. Matter separation. Going from C3 to C8, we see few differences. Still, there is more white matter here in dark blue than gray matter. Gracilis and Cuneatus tracks are present. Laptor horns are not present at this level in this specimen, but sometimes traces of them can be seen at this level. Anterior horns are not round. Ventral span is wider than dorsal span. This is the result of expansion of the ventral horns that is the major distinction between the upper and the lower cervical spinal cords that we have presented. From C8 to T10, changes are more noticeable. White matter remains more abundant than gray. Gracilis is present, not looking so slender as in the upper segments, and the cuneatus is absent. Notice that there is no dorsal indentation of the spinal cord. Lateral horns are present. Anterior horns are not round. Dorsal gray span is longer than ventral gray span. From T10 to L2, there are also significant changes. At L2, the amount of white matter and gray matter is about the same. The gracilis is present, the cuneatus is not. Lateral horns are not present at this level in this specimen, but sometimes traces of them can be seen at this level. Anterior horns are round. Great ventral span and dorsal spans are about equal. From L2 to S3, there is more great matter here looking white than white matter. White matter, gracilis is present, cuneatus is absent. There are no lateral horns. Anterior horns are round. Dorsal and ventral gray span is about equal. So the answer to this question is, B. Next question. This specimen is more likely from a C6 spinal segment than an L4 spinal segment. A true, B false. The algorithm here presented is helpful to determine the spinal cord level presented in this question. The first question is if the lateral horns, cunietus fasciculus, and gracilis fasciculus are present. That is, if all three of this structure are present in this specimen. A quick look to the specimen will allow us to see if this is so. And as you can see, they are not. The gracilis and cuneatus fasciculi are present, but the lateral horns are not present. Next, we should ask ourselves if both fasciculi are present. The answer to this question we already know from our previous observation. They are. At this point, we know that the level present is from C1 to C8 segment. The fact that the white matter ventral span is wider than the dorsal span indicates that the specimen is likely to be from C4 to C8. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. This specimen is more likely from an L4 spinal segment than from a C6 spinal segment. A true, B false. Observation of this specimen does not allow us to determine the presence of gracilis and cuneatus, or if only the gracilis is present.
a situation not depicted in the previously presented algorithm. But at this point, I will incorporate in the next frame, as you can see, an algorithm that takes into account the possibility of being uncertain about the presence of the cuneatus fascicle, as in this case. Such finding should prompt us to ask ourselves another question. The question is, are the lateral horns present? As you can see, in this case, the lateral horns are not present. So we choose no for path. This should be followed by another question. And that, that question is, if the shape of the anterior horns are round. And as you can see, they are. So the answer is, yes, they are round. So the specimen is likely to be from L3 to S5. This is confirmed by the fact that the amount of gray matter looks to be equal or more than the white matter. As you can see in this frame, comparing the C1 to C8 region to the L3 to S5 region. Notice the difference in the amount of white to gray, more white in the upper spinal region than in the lower spinal region. And the sharper edges of the gray matter in the upper spinal region than in the lower spinal region. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. A T10 specimen is more likely than an S4 specimen if the gracilis fascicle is present but cuneatus is not and the ventral horns are not round. A true, B false. If there is uncertainty about the presence or absence of lateral horns because virtually we cannot make a distinction or because information is not present in the question, then the next question is if the cuneatus is present. In this case, we are told that it is not. Next question is, are the anterior horns round? If the answer is no, as it is in this vignette, the specimen is likely to be from segment T7 to L2. As you can see in this frame, notice the difference in the shape of the horns between the upper and lower spinal cord regions and the volume difference between gray and white matter in the different regions. Just one second before leaving the topic of the amount of gray and white matter at different spinal cord segments, let's say that the visual estimation and MRI estimation of the amount of white and gray matter in a spinal cord segment do not yield the same results. In this diagram, the spinal segments are enumerated on top. The area under the cream line represents the size of the white matter area in each spinal cord as perceived by MRI volumetric studies. The area under the blue line represents the size of the gray matter in each spinal segment, again measured volumetric by MRI study. And as you can see, the only spinal segment with more gray matter than white matter are in the cervical region, and they are the cervical segment S2 to S4.
So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The bulk of fibers in the posterior funiculus are from neurons in the dorsal ganglia going to the gracialis and cuneatus nuclei. A true, B false. As we have previously mentioned, the white matter surrounds the gray matter in the spinal cord. This specimen is a cut at C8 level. We will use it to talk about the different structures in the different white matter compartments. The most easily isolated white matter compartment is the posterior funiculus. The, fo the posterior funiculus is located between the posterior median septum and the dorsal root entry. The rest of the white matter can be divided into a small anterior funiculus expanding between the medial sulcus and a line drawn from the most ventral region of the anterior horn to the anterior lateral sulcus, and the larger lateral funiculus extending from the same line to the dorsal root entry zone. The bulk of the fibers in the posterior funiculus arise from axons carrying conscious proprioception and two-point discrimination from neurons in the dorsal root ganglia going to the gracilis and the cuneatus nuclei. These axons enter the cord medially in the ventral root entry zone do not make contact with neurons at the entry level and go up ipsilaterally to contact neurons at the lower medulla. Axons from the lower body make contact with neurons in the nucleus gracilis. Those from the upper body do so in the nucleus cuneatus. These nucleus are in the lower medulla. Other ascending fibers in this funiculus are from neurons in the dorsal root ganglia of the lower extremity traveling to the nucleus of Clarke and by axons from the upper extremities traveling towards the cuneate accessory nucleus. Fibers carrying pain have also been reported to ascend in this tract. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The posterior funiculus has no descending fibers. A true, B false. Also in the dorsal funiculus we find descending fibers from the dorsal root ganglion forming the fasciculus interfasicularis in the upper spine and the septum marginal fasciculus in the lumbar region. The gracilis and the cuneatus nuclei also project ipsilaterally descending fibers that probably regulate ascending transmission. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The presence of Vibration sense indicate posterior column normalcy. A true, B false. Vibration is a modulated tactile sensation and not a special sensory modality. It is carried by uncrossed gracilis and cuneatus fasciculi fibers and by cross fibers traveling in the lateral funiculus. So the answer to this question is B. This appears not to be clinically relevant most of the time, but it strengthens the point that no sensory finding in the clinical exam should be taken to indicate pathology or the lack of it, unless corroborated by supporting findings. Next question. Crude touch and pressure sensation is carried in the anterior funiculus. A true, B false. The anterior funiculus contain ascending and descending tracts. One of the largest ascending tracts originates in the contralateral dorsal horn and terminates in the ventroposterior lateral thalamic nucleus. This tract carries crude touch and pressure sensation. Other ascending tracts in this funiculus 
are directed towards the brainstem nuclei, to the olive, to the reticular formation, and to the vestibular nucleus. They have not been depicted in this frame. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Vestibular spinal fasciculus, medial and lateral, provide inhibitory input for extensor and anti-gravitatory muscles. A true, B false. In addition to ascending tracts, the anterior funiculus also has descending tracts, which I have now introduced in light blue, they either make direct contact with the lower motor neuron or with interneurons that ultimately make contact with anterior horn motor neurons. Those making contact with the lower motor neuron directly belong to the pyramidal fibers that did not decussate at the level of the medulla. So they descend ipsilaterally to their, to their origin but crossing through the ventral white commissure once they are close to the intended lower motor neuron. The lower motor neuron they contact are those acting upon axial musculature. The descending fibers that make contact with interneurons are those from the pyramidal tract that we have just mentioned as well as those that I am about to mention. These brain stem to spinal cord tracts arise from the inferior olive. The fibers from the inferior olive cross in the brain stem and descend only as far as the cervical spine. The reticular formation. The tract formed from the reticular formation has extensor bias upper motor neuron neurons and it modulates muscle spindles. Another nuclei that projects to the spine from the brain stem is the vestibular nuclei. These, the nuclei from these tracts provide excitatory input for extensor and anti-gravitatory muscles. And from the tectum, the tectospinal tract arises from the contralateral superior colliculi crossing in the brain stem and mediating head turning movements in reaction to sudden auditory, visual, and tactile stimuli? The answer to this question is B. Next question. The lateral funiculus can be divided in three regions. The rim, the internal region behind the denticulate ligament, and the internal region in front of the denticulate ligament. A true, B false. The lateral funiculus has descending and ascending tracts. Most prominent are those in the rim that carry information to the cerebellum. Those deeper in the cord and anterior to the denticulate ligament indicated here by the triangular structure labeled DL are from cells in the dorsal horn whose axon cross shortly after their origin and travel to the thalamus carrying pain and thermal sensation. And to a lesser extent vibration as we previously mentioned and also touch. Those deeper in the core but posterior to the denticulate ligament are descending tracts. Here depicted in bright blue and the largest is the lateral or main pyramidal tract in command of voluntary movements for the limbs. Another tract in this area is the rubrospinal tract. This tract originates in the contralateral red nucleus crossing to the other side shortly after leaving the red nucleus and going down. This cross track is involved in the modulation of flexor movements of the upper limbs.
two other tracks are mentioned in Barr's book as traveling in this area. The raft spinal tract originating in the nucleus raft magnum of the medulla, this tract is believed to modify noxious stimuli in the hypothalamus spinal tract. This tract originates in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and innervates preganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic spinal neurons. This tract has fibers from a structure other than the hypothalamus in the brainstem involved in the regulation of autonomic function. So the answer to this question is A. True. Next question. The fasciculi propi has fibers that begin and end in the spinal cord. A. True. B. False. This is the figure from the last question. I am reintroducing it here to tell you about one more track. I have now introduced the fasciculi propi. This fasciculi consists of fibers interconnecting spinal segments. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The thoracic and lumbar spine cord drains into the ascending lumbar and azygos venous systems. A true, B false. Drainage of the spinal cord is extremely variable in its anatomy. Most of the veins of the thor thoracic and lumbar spinal cords drain to the azygo system or the ascending lumbar system. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The posterior spinal arteries arise from the basilar artery. A true, B false. This figure represents an overview of the arterial irrigation of the spine. As you can see, the aorta and major offshoots, the vertebral arteries, the ascending cerebral arteries, and the deep cerebral artery, as well as the thyrocervical trunk, contribute to the irrigation of the spine. In this frame, I have placed a rectangle in the upper part of the drawing, which I have enlarged in this new frame. The vascularity of this area is very important to our understanding of the irrigation of the spine. Here I am indicating to the anterior spinal artery. The anterior spinal artery originates from the confluence of arteries arising from the vertebral arteries. In addition to the anterior spinal artery, we also have two posterior spinal arteries. They may also arise from the vertebral arteries, but in other instances they arise from the posterior inferior cerebral arteries. This later eventuality is not present in this drawing. So, the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following spinal cord segment is more vulnerable to hypoxia based on the arterial irrigation pattern? A, C1, B, C5, C, L4, D, T12. Another area of interest regarding the irrigation of the spine is at the mid to low aortic region, which I have enlarged in this frame and added the corresponding vertebras. I will use this model to indicate how the arteries that irrigate the spine do so. Before we start our description, it is important to stress that a great deal of variability exists from patient to patient a fact that is reflected in many descriptions of this circulation you will find in different books. Having said this, I will start explaining to you the version I have found most useful. The arrow indicates the posterior intercostal arteries, 
also called by some authors the segmental arteries. Now the arrow indicates to the posterior branches of the posterior intercostal artery. It is from them that the spinal arteries arise. These arteries are a potential source of five other smaller arteries. These five arteries are not present at every level of the cord. At the level shown here, you can see the retrocorporeal arteries that irrigate the vertebral bodies. The tiny but important radicular arteries irrigating the roots and dorsal root ganglia. The right posterior radiculomedullary artery going towards the right posterior spinal artery and the left anterior radiculomedullary artery, in this case representing the great anterior radiculomedullary artery or the artery of Adam Kiewicz. This artery usually communicates with the anterior spinal artery between T10 and L1. This pattern of irrigation renders certain spinal cord areas more vulnerable to vascular injury than other. The most vulnerable areas are the anterior spinal cord regions corresponding to T4 and L1 and the posterior spinal cord regions corresponding from T1 to T3. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Solcal arterial syndrome consists of hemiplegia and loss of vibration sense on one side of the body and loss of pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side. A true, B false. This specimen corresponds to C5. I have now introduced an schematic representation of the irrigation of this spinal segment. I will point out to you the different structures. Here I am depicting the spinal artery, the one I mentioned as a possible source of five smaller arteries when I was going through the last question. From this artery we can trace the anterior radicular artery, the posterior radicular artery, these arteries irrigate the anterior and posterior spinal roots and dorsal ganglia, as we have previously mentioned. Now I am pointing to the anterior spinal medullary artery. And now to the anterior spinal artery. Now I am pointing to the posterior spinal medullary artery. And now to the left posterior spinal artery. You can see now the vasco-coronal artery in the back, which is also present in the front. The anterior and posterior vasco-coronal arteries encircle the cord and at times they connect with each other. The last artery I will mention is a very important artery, the sulcar artery. Notice that in this case it is turning to the right and irrigating the anterior gray matter of the anterior and lateral funiculus, while in the left side of the cord the same region is being irrigated by branches of the sulcar artery either from below or above. I am now introducing a C8 level specimen. The distribution of the vascularity is the same, but there is one important difference. The sulcal artery is now irrigating the left side. The right side depends on arterial irrigation from above or below the segment. The importance of this arterial organization is that one hemispinal region is more vulnerable than the other at a given spinal level. Now I'd like to show you two cases that highlight the importance of this arterial organization. The first case was reported in 2016 
Notice the age of the patient, the temporal evolution of the complaint and how it happened, the right-sided weakness, left-sided impaired pain and temperature sensation, and the normalcy of vibration and proprioception. These are the classical findings of so-called artery syndrome. This syndrome results from obstruction of the so-called artery. Now I am going to show you the second case. The history and finding in this case are compatible with the case we previously presented. But I have two reasons to show you this case. The first one is the MRI. Notice that the cord at this level is whiter than the surrounding tissue, indicating higher water content than the neighboring structures. And notice here that it is only on the right side that you see the increase in whiteness. The second reason I am showing you this case is that with correct treatment promptly initiated, the patient recovered completely or at least well. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Loss of temperature and pain sensation and normal position and vibration sense is consistent with a lesion involving the anterior commissure. A true, B false. This is a C5 specimen. The structure between the arrowheads is the anterior commissure. It is present in the whole length of the spinal cord. Now I have added the spinothalamic tract with color match labels for the fibers corresponding to the spinal segments. Now I have added the thick myelinated sensory fibers entering medial to the dorsal horn and ascending in the same side of the spine in the posterior columns. These fibers carry vibration, position and stereognosis. The fibers I have represented now are thin and unmelinated. They enter lateral to the vibration position stereognosis fibers and shortly after entering they make contact with sensory interneurons in the dorsal horn. This neuron's axon cross to the opposite side through the anterior commissure and ascend in the contralateral spinothalamic tract. These fibers carry pain and temperature. Now let's say we have a syrinx extending from C5 to T4, which I have represented as a red blob in the spinal cord involving the anterior commissure. Such a lesion will produce a cape-like bilateral symmetrical loss of pain and temperature sensation in the upper extremities and trunk with preservation of position, vibration, and stereognosis sensation in the same area. But if the syrinx grows Transversely, as represented here, lower motor weakness will occur as a consequence of anterior horn involvement and the sensory deficit will increase in territory due to involvement of the most medially located fibers in the spinothalamic tract as represented in this frame. Yet, the sacral dermatomes, especially the most distal one, S2, S3, S4, and S5 will be spared because the ascending fibers are most laterally located in the sp spinothalamic tract. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. A patient with loss of pain and temperature sensation in both hands is likely to have A. brown sequard syndrome B. Complete cord lesion C. Searings T6 D. Searings C6 to C8. In the course of, the, of answering this question, we will address four spinal syndromes. The first one, brown sequard syndrome, is due to damage to one half of the spinal cord. The clinical manifestations of brown sequard syndrome can be remembered thinking about the anatomy of the cord and the findings produced by the different anatomical structures. Absence of vibration, position, and stereognosis sensations 
occur below the injured side. Loss of pain and temperature sensation will occur in the opposite side. Loss of all sensory modalities which will occur in the same side at the level of the lesion. Upper motor neuron weakness will occur below the lesion on the same side and lower motor neuron weakness will occur in the territory corresponding to the lesion. The second spinal syndrome we will address is called complete cord lesion. All sensory modalities will be affected at the level of the lesion and below. Upper motor weakness will be present below the lesion. Lower motor weakness will be present at the lesion. The third spinal cord syndrome is caused by a syrinx. A very small syrinx isolated to one spinal segment, let's say T6, will produce loss of pain and temperature sensation at the level of T6 dermatome. A more vertically extensive lesion involving fewer spinal segments but horizontally restricted to the anterior commissure, here represented in red, will produce loss of pain and temperature in the corresponding dermatomes as presented in this frame, mainly involving the hands. Remember, that in the same distribution, vibration and position sensation will be preserved. This is important because patients with neuropathy, unlike those with syrinx, have all sensory modalities involved. Most of the time, the exception is when only small nerve fibers are involved, as in diabetes, small fiber neuropathy. But usually, in cases of a small fiber neuropathy, the legs are involved which is not the case in patients with C6 to C8 syrinx. The fourth spinal cord syndrome we will address occurs when only the spinothalamic tract is involved. Let's say this tract is involved at the level of T6. Here, the deficit will only include loss of pain and temperature sensation, contralateral to the lesion as represented here. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Patient with sacral spearing usually have A. Normal flexion of great toe. B. Normal anal wink. C. Normal perianal sensation. D. All of the above. Sacral spearing implies an island of normalcy surrounded by a sea of abnormality. Sacral spearing implies that the sacral sensation is normal despite being surrounded by absence of pain and temperature sensation. This condition is usually associated with signs of lower motor weakness in the arm and upper chest, since it is usually produced by a syrinx involving the cervical and thoracic area. This peculiar symptomatology resulting from a cervical or thoracic spinal cord lesion is due to a sparing of the laterally placed sacral sensory fibers in the spinothalamic tract and pyramidal tract. This translates clinically into a normal anal wing reflex, which tests normalcy in the sacral segment 3 and 4, normal perianal pain and temperature sensation, implying normal ascending spinothalamic fibers from this area, and normal great toe flexion, which implies normal descending motor fibers. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following distinguishes conus medullary syndrome from caudal equina syndrome? A. Bladder dysfunction. B. Fecal incontinence. C. Impotence. D. Asymmetrical sensory findings. This figure is a cartoonish representation of the lower spine. Some retrievers are labeled. Remember that at this level, all spinal nerves exit the spinal canal below the respective vertebra. This figure also shows the cauda equina and the formation of femoral and sciatic nerves.
the pelvic explanic nerve carrying parasympathetic afferent and efferent fibers and the pudendal nerve. A conus medullary lesion involved the lowermost region of the spinal cord corresponding to segment sacral 3 to coccyx 1. So the pudendal nerve and pelvic nerve functions will be affected. The vertebras involved corresponds to mainly L1 but at times L2. Deep tendon reflexes of the legs are normal since these reflexes involve S1 and S2 fibers for the ankle and L3 and L4 fibers for the patella and these roots are spared with conus syndrome. Strength is also normal. Sensory deficit will involve all modalities and be distributed in the S3, S4 and S5 dermatomes, those producing a saddle-like configuration, as represented in this figure by the magenta area. The deficit will be symmetrical. The bladder will show flaccid paralysis. There will be rectal incontinence and impotence. The genitalia area will also have sensory deficits since the penis cutaneous innervation is from S3. Pain is a late occurrence and it does not have a radicular distribution. In Caldequina syndrome, when the lesion is low in the spinal canal, it involves the same nerve fibers that when the lesion is in the conus medullaris, that is S3 to coccyx 1, but this time the lesion is at the level of the sacral bone, as indicated by the burst in this frame. Such a lesion produces pelvic explanic nerve and pudendal nerve dysfunction, as conus medullaris lesion does, but with some distinguishing features. Radicular pain is an early symptom. Sensory deficit is in the same region as the conus syndrome, but it is asymmetrical. Thus, it does not have a saddle-like configuration. As in patients with conus lesion, motor exam is normal. Bladder has a flaccid paralysis. Impotence is present. And fecal incontinence is also present. When the cauda equina syndrome is due to a lesion high in the canal, as indicated here by the burst, the fibers involved include those from L4 to the coccyx. Hence, the pudendal, pelvic, splagnic, and the sciatic nerve will be involved. The femoral nerve will at least be partially spared since some of its fibers come from L3 and L2. In high caudequina lesion, radicular pain occurs early, bladder, flaccid paralysis, impotence, and rectal incontinence are the rule. Sensory deficit affects all modalities and will correspond to dermatomes affected, but it will be very asymmetrical. Lower motor neuron weakness in the sciatic and pudendal nerves distribution will be present. Patellar reflex is usually spared because it is carried not only by L4 but also by L3 fibers. But ankle reflex is absent. So the answer to this question is D. Thank you very much for your attention.